Are you a scaling SaaS founder? Ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel Podcast, where marketing strategies are like a good espresso, strong, invigorating, and no bitter aftertaste. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I help B2B SaaS founders like you scale from seven figures, which is good, to eight and nine figures, which is outstanding. Together, we supercharge revenue growth, create premium valuation, and craft the business you're proud of and a life of impact and freedom that you love. Well, this last week, a friend called me and invited me to Austin City Limits Festival next month. It's two full weekends. And I kind of thought summer festival season was over, but I guess here in Texas, we got to wait until it cools off a little bit. One band jumped out to me and just kind of looking at the list and Foo Fighters. I'm like, okay, hey, that makes it a worthwhile drive from Dallas to Austin. And it's a festival, so there are like a hundred other bands playing, maybe more than that. A handful of headliners, uh, Shania Twain, Lumineers, uh, Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, Mumford and & Sons, and, and a whole bunch of other bands. I have no idea who they are. Uh, a couple of headliners, I have no idea who they are. <laughs> maybe I should. I don't know. We'll see. But as we were talking about all the bands and debating whether it was easier to get noticed today as a band versus maybe 20 years ago, what do you think? Is it easier today or harder? Our conclusion was it's both. You know, some, some things are harder, some things are easier. It's easier to, you know, with online presence, but uh, there's so much noise out there. Yeah, so it, I think it's both. People are people. So at its core, marketing is the same today as it was a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago. It's like it's always been, you know, getting attention, getting in front of people. The methods and channels are way different and those continue to change for sure. But especially in a market like today, the methods and channels, marketing isn't one dimensional. It's not just like one thing. Like, okay, I'm going to do digital marketing. So I put an ad on Facebook or Cardiogram and, and, you know, there it is. Now there's much more to it, especially in B2B marketing. As we continued talking, we decided that marketing is actually a lot like a band. You know, different instruments, different nuances, each part is doing its own thing. But the important part is we're all playing the same song in harmony and in time. You know, the song is the core marketing message. Have you ever been to a company website and then maybe go to a social media page or something else and the two just did not line up? You're like, is this even the same company? Are the colors the same? Is it even the same logo? What they're they're pitching something on social that's not even on the website, or maybe it's on the website. I was reading the descriptions. Even it's like I don't even think that's the same company, and, but it is. But they're playing different songs, and that's not what we want. We want the same song, different instruments, all those parts working together for the good of the whole. And at festivals, bands are using kind of a, a partner or channel strategy. You know, the other 99 bands there, however many there are, are tapping into the Foo Fighter audience. So if you like this, you may like that. And at the same time, some very disparate audiences. There's a lot of musical diversity at Austin City Limits. Some, you know, very, very wide range of things. And, and interesting band names, too. Like a band called We Don't Ride Llamas. I checked out that website. Not at all what I expected. Uh, bass drum of death. Or how about this rattlesnake milk? I mean, that, that sounds like a, a, a good band, right? That's a good band name for sure. And I suppose you can milk a rattlesnake, but it's not necessarily what you think. So instead of rattlesnake milk having to do all of their own marketing and hype, you know, I find them and they're right there on the bill. I mean, a name like that, I couldn't help but check them out. And so go over to Spotify and their album is called Chicken Fried Snake. You know, well, I have to appreciate that kind of a pun. So you give them a little bit of a listen. And so some of the ones that are out there, I mean, maybe they're my thing, maybe they're not. But it gives that exposure to a much wider audience using the channel. And that's kind of the idea behind the, the channel strategy. There's an entire chapter in my book, Small Fish, Big Pond, about partnerships and channels. And we have a framework called the Partner Network Navigator that our clients use to tap into 
other people's audiences. Some companies that you would know that have done really, really well with this, uh, Cisco. They did super well early on, especially with their partner ecosystem. That was their primary go-to-market channel and contributed to about 85% of their revenue. Really, really smart. So very different from a traditional tech company and how they market it. Intel became number one with their Intel Inside campaign. They weren't advertising to you, like go out and buy an Intel chip. It just became cool because it, you know, everything had Intel Inside, all the cool things you wanted. And of course, like, you know, Blue Man Group, they did a bunch of advertising, more kind of brand awareness kind of things. Uh, but it was all partner strategy because it was, that was their core thing is their chips were in things that you wanted. And so to, to make that preference for Intel, uh, Intel Inside. Not every channel marketing strategy fills stadiums. Misaligned partners, muddled messaging can turn your rock anthem into a garage band's first rehearsal. You know, like, you know, when a drummer can't keep time and the guitarist is playing a different song altogether or just noodling around, not even playing the song that everybody else is. So how do we turn your channel marketing into a chart-topping hit? I mean, how do we find the Bono to your edge, the Jagger to your Richards, the peanut butter to your jelly roll? Ready to be rock stars in the SaaS world? Well, grab a leather jacket, maybe your shades, and let's turn your brand into the next big thing. I and mean, who knows? Your channel marketing might be the next stairway to heaven. So let's rock on. If you want more number one hits in your SaaS, check out today's sponsor. It's my book, Small Fish Big Pond, Building a World-Class Business that Swims Circles Around Competitors. Small Fish Big Pond delivers powerful marketing and leadership lessons guaranteed to enhance your marketing message, wrap value around your clients, and guide their buying journey to conclude that your company is the only solution for them. It includes step-by-step -step frameworks, time-tested growth principles to attract ideal clients, convert them, and transform them into your brand ambassadors. Get the print, ebook, or audio today at smallfishbigpond.com. Amazon, or wherever it is you love to buy books. All book profits go to charity and always have. We were in Hawaii uh, a couple of weeks ago when the fire started and came home, and, and Maui was just hammered. Heavily populated area, total devastation, tragic loss of life, and, and still so many people missing. And so if you want to help, check out Hawaii Community Foundation. It's hawaiicommunityfoundation.org or Red Cross. Both are on the ground and very involved in day-to-day -day relief efforts. All profits for August are going to help the people in Maui in addition to what we're doing uh, personally and uh, the company as well. So if you want to partner with us, always appreciate that. And I know that uh, your contributions are always appreciated uh, and helping out the, the people over there that have lost so much over the past few weeks. Our founder on Tuesday was Bish Smear, founder and CEO of a fintech SaaS called Enigmatic Smile. Bish shared his experience building two sides of a network, providers and consumers, plus great insights into motivators, customer loyalty, and creating raving fans. You know, his company creates loyalty programs that actually create loyalty. It's pretty amazing. It's one of my all-time favorite episodes. He is such a joy to talk with and fantastic. Our expert guest last Thursday was Harry Spate, Master of Complex Sales in Hyper-Competitive Sales Environments. Sound like your world? It's definitely mine. He's also the author of Selling with Dignity and host of the Sales Made Easy podcast. He gave great insights about how to make sales a win for all, you and your prospect, and be a great experience for both of you at the same time. If you missed either of those episodes, go back and give them a listen for sure. My guest this week is Dan Radu, president of Macro, a team of experts helping grow companies with both digital marketing strategies and execution of marketing campaigns at scale. With expertise in Marketo, Salesforce, Pardo, HubSpot, and similar MarTech, Dan and his team are who leaders call when they want to make better data-driven decisions or need help scaling their global marketing operations. Welcome, Dan Radu. Hey, Dan, welcome to SaaS Fuel. Hi, great to ha have me here. Great to meet you. And uh, thanks for this opportunity. Absolutely. Well, you've been running an agency, B2B marketing, for uh, a number of years now. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah, Jeff. So it's 
We started in uh, 2014. It was, I always knew I wanted to build a business and uh, had jobs in marketing and I had jobs in technology. Then uh, this was just a combination of that. So yeah, my uh, small projects turn into business work and business work turn into bigger business work. So that's when I realized there's, you know, there's a real opportunity to bring value to customers, usually B2B global marketing teams. And um, more companies uh, came to me to solve those problems and uh, do those uh, B2B marketing campaigns. Did you have a background in B2B marketing before you started? Or is this something you kind of worked into? I did to some extent. Yeah, I did to some extent. One something, one interesting uh, way to think about it is when I started, it was still in my mid-20s. So for me, it was the sort of the intersection of a little bit of experience and not so much responsibilities. So if I would have waited more, I would have had more responsibilities in life, probably become less of a risk taker <laughs> and but have more experience. Well, here I was, you know, with some experience and no responsibilities. So uh, that was the sweet spot for me. <laughs> it's really interesting that you're at a point where you're, you're able to take some risk, able to go out there and do some things and, and make it happen and build a business uh, without having to worry about, uh, you know, who else it may impact. Yeah, yeah, it definitely makes a difference. I think the statistics I've seen that the average age of a CEO is something around mid forties, and uh, I mean you can, you know, everybody. It's relatively easy in our world in North America to start a business, and and it's also easy then to to become successful or to to do it over a long period of time. But uh, of course, you have to think about what your level of risk and what responsibility you have, what impact it has. And, uh, if everything goes uh, south, who else are you dragging with you? Yes, <laughs> sure. So, yeah, you know, a little bit of experience and a lot of excitement uh, that can produce some amazing marketing results. I mean, how did that serve you? And uh, and you know, having that experience and maybe not too much experience, but then having the excitement to go out there and create something special. It was very important, I think, for me to be realistic about it and also to understand what's the level of work, what's the quality that I can produce, what can I do for my experience. So when you run, let's say when you're an independent consultant, first you have to spend your time in um, learning new things. You have to spend your time in finding new projects. You have to spend your time in administrative things, taxes, keeping track of invoices and payments. And then there's actual work that you get paid for. So it was very important for me to balance that uh, bandwidth of time. How do I allocate it? How much do I allocate in learning? What am I learning? Am I learning B2B marketing? Am I learning business uh, skills? That was important for me to balance it. And also the type of client that we take on. So, you know, we don't want to take on, promise more things that we can actually deliver. I mean, yeah, you have a little bit of imposter syndrome in the beginning, but then sure. you have to you have to manage your imposter syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I, I think I still have that. You know, twenty years in, of uh, <laughs> you know, wondering, you know, it, it, because there's 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 so much out there that uh, that I know I don't know, and every day I learn more that I don't know. Uh, so that's uh, something I think is is always a challenge. Yeah, and funny uh, how we go through this uh, Donner Kruger, uh, the dummy curve, or how you call it. Yes. The, <laughs> uh, yeah, in the beginning, you have a bit of luck. You think that, yeah, you nail it, you know everything. And then, boom, you get head in a fade. Everything goes downhill and then you slowly go to this uh, plateau of success and knowledge. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it, it's amazing how brilliant I was in my 20s and now how dumb I am, you know, this this much later with all this additional experience. And it's, it's really kind of funny. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> there's a difference between attitude, ego. Attitude and knowledge. <laughs> so yes, one goes yeah. up, the other one goes down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So definitely less ego and, and a lot more knowledge um, over the years, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. So how has marketing technology uh, affected your business? How, do, how are you using that uh, to help your clients? Marketing technology, it's something that uh, our business is built upon. So it's the ability of using cloud tools, having team members from Canada work with her clients in the U.S. Uh, relatively easy. It's crucial. Our business is built upon marketing technology. Business is built upon companies using all kinds of complex tools and systems. And uh, 
being able to and uh, needing help without needing expertise, uh, needing extra hands and brains. And one of the, the latest strategies we talked about was about intent data. How are you using that to help capture leads and, and know when the right time is uh, for the right messaging? There's more, more of these tools uh, uh, now are become quite sophisticated in how they identify companies looking at websites and what categories they fall into and what type of uh, campaigns are triggered from there. So a lot of it is based on this reverse IP lookup. So basically, if there's a team of people doing research, they come to the website, they might not want to fill out a form to register for sign up for something, but then... You know, they're browsing uh, different documents. I can measure things like how long they've been on certain pages. What do they look at? And then what is that company? Is that in your ideal customer profile and so on? And then different strategies and tactics that you can build upon that. And so is that something that you're using like in account-based marketing? Is that the, the, yeah, so the application? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of account-based marketing tools that, uh, that leverage that to so like assess intent data. And then a lot of that can get matched with a lot of the databases and um, Zoom Info, Dun & Bradstreet, for example. And yeah, that makes sense. So what are the, the latest strategies that are working right now in uh, B2B marketing? What interesting uh, trend that we notice is in the go-to-market strategies of companies. A lot of companies go directly, but a lot also uh, a lot of companies invest more and more in going indirectly, so going through channels and through partners. So you can think of it, you know, besides buying your gadgets, when is the last time that the company bought something directly, or you bought? So it's like a distributor. There's like a reseller or implementer of. Uh, different tools or different uh, widgets. So channel marketing strategies become more and more important. Now we, we see company allocating budgets for that, even allocating what they call market development funds. So um, market uh, allocating funds for running joint marketing campaigns, building alliances, co-selling initiatives. I absolutely love partner channels and it's something that's worked really, really well for me over the years. Um, in, in your mind, what makes a great partnership? Well, a great partnership is to understand the mutual value. I mean, like, how is it with, uh, it's like a partnership in, uh, in life, right? With your significant other. Uh, what is the mutual value? If, uh, if there's a software vendor and then there's um agency that implements that software or that's white, white label services, what is the benefit? Is it what value do they bring? What is the expectations? Um, obviously, when I say that channel marketing is part of the go-to-market strategy, it means that the software vendor is looking at these partners to bring leads. So all the money that they allocate and resources they're being allocated in running co-marketing and co-selling campaigns are with the purpose of drawing leads and recording that and feeding that back to their sales organization. So how effectively can that be done? What's the best use? What's the, the most efficient way of allocating funds for the vendor? And, and then what's the value that these partners can bring in their marketing activities when they're in the field with, uh, with customers, then how do you track all that? It's not easy. No, it's not. The partnerships are, are difficult, but uh, done well, they're very effective and, and certainly worth it. But I think you're, you're right on. Having that alignment is, uh, is key, not something that's, that's lopsided where you have uh, a winner and a loser. That, that's, that's not a partnership. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And a lot of big companies, they feel they're such a big muscle. Um, you know, so it's Salesforce, so it's Adobe, so it's Oracle. And, you know, they, they know that they can uh, flex that muscle. So it's a, it's a very fine game to play. So how have you found success with uh, when big companies want to flex their muscles and, and push around smaller companies? <sighs> sometimes, yes, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think you have to look at yourself and be realistic and understand your value. You know, like why would, well, let's say our partners, why would our partners use us? You know, why is a smaller company more nimble, more agile, better than a bigger organization? Because it just has more resources, more people to dedicate to the partnership versus um, 
a small company that um, maybe just focus on doing very efficient and good work. That makes sense. Well, what, uh, what is working well or what are some mistakes that you see uh, companies making in their marketing? Maybe that's a good one to start with first. Uh, tell me about some mistakes. Because I'll bet I've made them all. Well, there's so many mistakes. <laughs> there's so many mistakes. Like in uh, you know, ten years running the business now and working with different B two B global marketing organizations, sure. there's a lot of things you see. I see a lot of there's constant changes. The organizations are con- constantly reorganizing, re- uh, restructuring, reallocating these to become more efficient. Sometimes um, those efficiencies don't really come or. Sometimes uh, tech debt, it's a, a problem. When I say uh, tech debt, I mean uh, building this, subscribing to all kind of uh, software and SaaS that's supposed to help the marketing department. But then you have so much of it and so many subscriptions, you don't even know what does what. And then it just becomes unbearable and, ma- uh, and manageable. And then you have, uh, you know, three different software subscriptions that send emails or three different software subscriptions that capture leads with forms and, uh, and this overlap functionality. We call that overlap functionality. So at one point, this becomes too cumbersome and you can't, you just can't manage it. So you spend more time managing the technology than actually enabling the business or drawing benefits and. Sure. Yeah. Too many systems or or chasing shiny objects. That's something that's so hard not to do. Yeah. Because every, every new thing that comes out, I mean, especially now you you have a tool that you're using and working with and and may have had for a while and then something new and shiny comes out and it does the same kind of thing, but now has AI or has some feature Mm -hmm. that, uh, that you think, Oh, this, this is, this is the magic bullet. And so this is, I've got to switch to that. So I'll get that one and I get another one and another one. Yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. right. I, th- I think uh, almost every uh, vendor that uh, we work with has a play on AI now. Yes, like, I you, believe it. You, you can be considered serious SaaS if you don't <laughs> if you don't have something with AI. Yeah, <laughs> that was Q1. Yeah, 2023 Q1 was definitely the <laughs> the AI quarter. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Hey, you see that everywhere. It's and some of it is is pretty good. Some of it, I think they just stick AI on there just because it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's really any better or even does anything. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, uh, like, I think these days you can approve any budget if it's part of AI play, right? So. Right, right. Yeah, spend that money. <laughs> so, what? Uh, how have expectations changed uh, with uh, buyers? You know, the B two B. How have buying patterns changed? Whether that's you know through the pandemic or you know as things have moved more online, there's more people involved in the decision making process. I think. Uh, Maybe five years, seven years ago, a lot of companies were not so conscious about the resources they need. Um, people, time for, um, for implementing a lot of marketing technologies that they, they work with. But I think a little bit companies become more mature. A lot of those uh, directors, they change two, three jobs now. They've been through through the same uh, struggles. And now uh, when, now in this job market, they, they understand, they become more realistic about what's possible, what's not possible, how fast a marketing technology stack can be up and running, how, what resources that you need, what agency partners you need. Do you think they're more informed today? Are they doing more research online? Is that what you're seeing? Like content marketing, is that, is that working well or is content dead? I don't think content was ever dead. I think content always existed and it always existed before the internet, right? Messages, your, your message, sure. your, whether you read the newspaper, whether you read a book, a pamphlet or, or something else, there was, there was always a message. There was always information. There was always a method of you being informed that was always there. And I don't really, I don't think it's going to die. Like I don't think AI is going to take over that. <laughs> So I, I just think that the people have more experience. I think the people in um, decision making uh, power with decision making power at the moment they have more experience. I think they've been through through la- through the last decade. So if they have ten years of experience, they've been they've seen quite they've seen a lot of things uh, not work, and well, that's what they're maybe they so they have those jobs now. Right, right. 
you know, a lot of things that haven't worked or maybe you haven't lived up to expectations. So there was a lot of hype or a lot of expectation about what a solution would bring and then it, it fell flat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, I think it's quite uh, ironic that uh, even the marketing teams at software and technology companies, they've, you know, they're in charge of uh, selling in a category or creating all this buzz and becoming the shiny object, but then they fall for the marketing of their vendors that they use. <laughs> yeah, guilty. Yeah, I definitely have, uh, have done that uh, for sure. So do you think because of that and solutions falling flat, is it, is it extending the sales cycle? You know, are you seeing any of that in the marketplace where you know, something that, that you know, used to be much quicker is now taking longer or having more people look at it first? Having more people, more input, yes. Some of the deals might be delayed if the budget is not uh, available, if the company still believe that we're uh, going towards the bottom of a recession. Uh, they might delaying making this investment and they just want to make the most of what they have. Yeah. How do we better align our message so that the expectations, the, the reality is as good or better than the expectations? How do you align it? Well, I, I, we always have to speak to the economic uh, conditions, right? You speak about growth, speak about resilience, you speak about continuity, you speak about doing uh, more with less investment. You speak about quality. That makes sense. Do you think technology, I mean, it's, it is changing. And, and like you said, I mean, Q1 especially it was just crazy with AI and new things coming out. Is technology moving faster than implementation? You know, can, we, can we absorb, can we deploy technology as fast as it's, it's evolving? That's a big problem, actually. It's called, I've seen that uh, called the MarTech law. So technology is changing, evol evolving exponentially, where the organizations, they, uh, they don't change that fast. So people can catch up so fast with all the functions and what the software vendors can offer. Um, your customers cannot get used to what, how the tools could be used or to sell to you. Yeah, absolutely. That is a problem. So is that why expectations are, are not met? Is because we're not really deploying the technology or using it to its capacity? Well, you're being sold on certain capacity, but then it just takes too much, too many resources to do it. And uh, also, it's a division of class as well. If the company doesn't have enough money to use partners to hire people to make proper roadmaps and implementation. They just simply cannot do it. They cannot draw the benefit. And um, the companies uh, then that can do that, they can succeed. They can draw the benefits of the technology. They can have their business enabled by the technology. But the companies that don't, they just cannot cannot get over that, uh, that chasm. And then they get uh, disappointed and they fall short. But a lot of the SaaS uh, companies, they come with one year, three year, five year subscriptions. All right. So uh, right. then you, you, you stuck spending this money. And then if the, if the director of marketing has a job for two years, three years, um, that might be even shorter than what a SaaS subscription is. That happens a lot. Somebody comes into a new role and they've inherited a bunch of stuff and uh, subscriptions and you know, may or may not be what they want to use or may not even be in use at all. So do you think smaller companies or bigger companies have an advantage when it comes to keeping up with the speed of technology? Uh, bigger companies, just because they okay. can have more people that they can dedicate it for this. As a small more company, resources. you have to do a job at a smaller company involves so many different aspects and roles combine, often combine into one. So you just, just can't keep track of of everything, but a bigger company can have one person dedicated to account-based marketing, have a team dedicated to AI, uh, and so on. That makes sense. So how do small companies compete with bigger enterprises? So what, what can they do? One of my favorite questions. Oh, what can companies? Well, maybe <laughs> they can uh, address different uh, markets. Uh, so for example... A smaller company can come in and say, okay, we are not an enterprise SaaS. Uh, we don't have the SOC 
or the ISO certificates. We don't have, we might not have uh, all this uh, uh, requirements that uh, a big company, a big customer might vet us, but we might be very good for a smaller market. So we have to go broad. So instead of going very targeted after this large enterprise, you can maybe you can go broad for uh, um, uh, multiple customers like that. So I like that. So focus on different type of customers. So over the the last few years, especially, we've we've gotten a lot more remote, a lot more global. Teams have uh, are much more dispersed and uh, and diverse today. Um, yeah, what have you seen in the the marketing space for uh, you know offshore outsourcing those types of things? Well, cloud and marketing clouds have enabled uh, global resources to work on a global market. And uh, we have a global team as well. From the beginning, we wanted to be global. We wanted to nail down global practices in working. So uh, we have agile marketing, collaboration tools, um, sharing, taking account of different time zones, regions. Um, so we've done all that from the beginning. And uh, that brought us where we are today. And companies like a large enterprise can definitely reduce a lot of reduce a lot of costs and if they use a partner with global resources. Uh, you might not want to replace jobs in all cases. You can look at uh, simply augment your team. So you can look at managers. In North America, the pressure is always for you to do more strategic work and always do more more high value work so you can be a manager, so you can manage the business and manage the system because there's always, because there's the outsourcing and globalization trend, right? So yeah, there is a specialist right. who can do hands-on operations and technical work, right? But uh, so then in order to to have a valuable role in, in North America, then you want to focus on the management of that in the team. So how do you find a great outsourcing team or a partner uh, to work with? Well, first uh, you look at your re- you look at your regions, you look at your global needs. You look at you know does the is the partner specialized in the tools that you use in the marketing technologies? Does he have uh, the uh, depth and breadth of uh, experience? Um, are they do they have different uh, team? Do they have a full team structure with project manager, client services, execution resources? Can they bring additional resources to the table as needed? I like that. So you run an agency. And the question that I always wonder about is there's lots of agencies out there. How do you know when you have a great agency and how do you find the best agency to work with? I think you have to think about your agencies as partners. It's it's a partnership. So you have to invest that in your mutual success. The agencies uh, brings resources to the table. They can augment your team. They can accelerate projects. They can... Uh, help you scale. If you have certain bottlenecks, the agency can do that work. Or maybe sometimes the agency partner knows something that you don't know, and then you can draw that benefit from them. You you have to work towards making it a mutual uh, beneficial relationship. So I tell my clients when they ask, Dan, can you can your team do this for us? Is like, yes, we can, but uh, I'll be able to do it just uh, in uh, a few weeks once I have this in place. So they they appreciate that honesty, and then they want to. You know, when you have a partnership, they want to be invested in your success as well, because then we're invested in their success. I like that. So, marketing technology. What are your three favorite tools, and what do they do? Oh, three favorite tools. <laughs> And uh, there, there, there's so many of them. There's so many. Yeah, we're about to, of... to release some shiny objects here. Okay. So, what, what are your top three? Well, I think uh, a tech stack uh, with the right tools that uh, we would recommend will always um, serve different functions. So, for example, in terms of uh, this intent data, we see Six Sense as uh, a good uh, a good player in the market. Okay. Then in terms of marketing automations, we think that uh, uh, Market on HubSpot are very good for what they do. They might be addressing different type of markets, but they're very well positioned. The software is very mature. 
And then in terms of um, tracking your leads and uh, passing them to sales, I think uh, Salesforce CRM does a, a good job. Okay. Outstanding. Well, where can people learn more about you online? Oh, well, you can definitely uh, find me on uh, LinkedIn or you can just uh, check out our website, uh, uh, revenueoperations.agency. So revenueoperations.agency and uh, that leads you to Macromator, macromator.com. But revenueoperations.agency, it's easier to, to find. Excellent. Then really enjoyed our conversation today. Appreciate you being on the show. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, you, uh, everybody found this very useful. Outstanding. Thanks again, Dan, for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom and expertise. You can learn more about Dan at macromator.com. All links, highlights, resources, full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. Subscribe or follow us there and check us out on YouTube also. Everyone who subscribes this week gets a 24-7 marketing muse, always ready to sing into your ear the next big idea. Occasionally, it might suggest viral cat videos. Uh, Apparently, it may need some fine-tuning. But join us next week for David Rush, founder and CEO of Small World. It's a SaaS platform that is revolutionizing lead generation referrals and warm introductions. Think you know how it's done? I have seen it all, but I've never in my life seen anything like this. It'll blow your mind that it even exists. It's pretty exceptional. And he's built an amazing company around that idea as well. And then next week on our SaaS Fuel Expert Series, we have Christine McDaniel, founder of the Magnolia Firm. It's an M&A brokerage firm helping digital business owners like SaaS achieve the perfect exit. So I will see you next time. And as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SaaS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned, are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes. Let's go!